times. I'm like, did I come up at the wrong time? <laughs> Whew, that freaked me out. Okay, uh, I want to welcome everybody out today. Uh, and we are still in our series, uh, the, our Hope series, uh, over our study of First and Second Thessalonians. Uh, and I'm going to be pretty brief on my brief recap, actually, for once, because we got quite a bit to cover. Uh, but Paul had been encouraging uh, this, this young church uh, in Thessalonica. Uh, and despite being young, I mean, they were, they were mature beyond their years. I mean, they could withstand persecution. They were withstanding false teaching. They were just very dedicated. Uh, and that really inspired Paul, so he really took them under his wing. Uh, now, the core theme of this book uh, is preparing for the return of Christ. And everything you see him teaching uh, and encouraging people to do here is so that they can be prepared for if Christ were to come back today. Uh, he'd been encouraging them to be, you know, to continue to be faithful and, and you know, to continue to stand strong and, and live these godly lives uh, because until the Lord returns, he wanted them serving God. He wanted them focused on that. And the way he saw it was if they were focused on that, he knew that when the Lord returned, they would be rewarded. So in chapter 4, uh, Paul gets into pretty great detail. Now, remember, this is setting up some end times prophecy um, that we'll be covering a lot of next week. Uh, but this kind of leads us into that uh, because he really wanted to go into great detail about what a godly life should look like. That's something he really wanted to spend some time on. Now, remember, Paul truly believed that Jesus was going to return any minute. I mean, he thought he was going to return in his lifetime. So he wanted this young church to have a sense of urgency uh, about serving God. He didn't want them to put it off and, you know, and get distracted. He wanted them to have a sense of urgency, urgency about serving him. So uh, to Paul, any kind of sinful behavior was just a distraction. And he's saying, listen, just avoid that stuff. It could hinder you at this critical time in your development. Uh, now, the distraction Paul warns his readers about in verses 1 and 2 is sexual immorality, which we're going to be covering. Uh, because the enemy knows, I mean, how powerful that human sexual desire is, and so he uses it. Anything he can use to manipulate us, he will, and this is one of the greatest uh, temptations he can use. Because giving into temptation, whether it be sexual or not, always hinders our effectiveness for God, and that's what he's, you know, shooting for. So the title of today's message is Living Life Expectantly, uh, because every believer should live, talk, and act like Jesus is going to be back today, which is basically what live and expect it means. Okay, that's as fast as I can catch you up. Let's jump right in today. We're going to start in chapter 4, verse 1. And it says, finally, dear brothers and sisters, we urge you in the name of the Lord Jesus to live in a way that pleases God as we have taught you. You live this way already, and we encourage you to do so even more. So I love what he does in verse 1 because it's really masterful. He actually masterfully mixed instruction and encouragement into one sentence. I mean, which Paul's really wordy. It kind of shocks me he actually condensed that, but he really did it masterfully. Because first he instructed them to live lives that were pleasing to God. He's saying live lives that if, if Christ were to return today, what he would find you doing would be pleasing to him, is what he was saying. Now, he admitted that they'd already been doing that, but, you know, he just wanted to encourage them, which is the second thing. He wanted to encourage them to continue doing that and not to let the passion fade. I don't know if you recognize this, but, you know, over time, if you don't stay close to the Word of God and, you know, and, and stay close in fellowship and worship, it's easy, you know, to, to lose a little bit of your passion. You know, and that's, that's just because the world's pushing us so hard the other way. It's easy to do that, and he was really encouraging them not to do that. But in verses 2 through 5, I mean, he is very specific about one sin, especially to avoid. So look at this. Uh, verse 2, it says, For you remember what we taught you by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's will is for you to be what? Holy. Let's try that again. Everybody's like, I'm not going to talk till they do. All right. So uh, he wants us to be what? Holy. holy. There we go. He wants us to be holy and to stay away from all what? Sexual, Sexual sin. Everybody's going, I can't say that. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> Sexual sin. Verse 4. Then each of you will control his own body and live in holiness and honor, not in lustful passion like the pagans who do not know God and his ways. So the first thing Paul told them to do is to be holy. Now, some of your Bibles might say sanctified holy or sanctified. And that's because uh, they both come from the same root word. If you look at the NASB, it actually translates this a little bit more accurate. I'm not sure if they got that when I sent it, but uh, I'll just read it. First Thessalonians 4, 3 in the NASB says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. So the words holy and sanctified both come from the same Greek word, and it's hagiasmas, and you don't have to remember that. But the definition for hagiasmas is to cons consecrate, consecration, or dedication, as in dedicating oneself to God. 
That's the definition of that. And so both of them actually fit. Holy fits that definition because it comes from the same root word, and so does sanctified. So either translation would be right. Uh, so first thing Paul wanted them to do was be committed and dedicated to God. It's really, really hard to, to have a church that's successful if everybody's not on the same page. You know, if everybody's not focused on the same thing, serving God and, and putting ourselves on the back burner so we can put other people before us and reach them with the message of Christ, uh, if everybody's not on the same page, it's tough. And he really wants them to be committed and dedicated to God. So he first said, you know, be holy. Uh, but next, he, he mentioned specific sin to avoid, and it was sexual immorality. Now, sexual sin, some of your Bibles might say, some may say sexual immorality. But again, they come from the same Greek word, and that Greek word is pornea. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Pornea. We get our English words pornography and pornographic from that, okay? Uh, it's, it's, it's better translated sexual immorality than it is sexual sin because it's just all kinds of sexual immorality. But um, before I move on, I want to really explain why Paul wanted to discuss this topic, okay? At that time, and the time this was written, sexual immorality was really, really commonplace. It was bad. Uh, in Rome, there were pagan temples where they had prostitutes, male and female, serving in those temples. And they actually used sex for worship. How perverted is that, right? And, and many people believe that the people who served as prostitutes in that temple had to volunteer for certain terms of time, and then someone else had to do it as a worshiper of that deity. I mean, if you can even fathom how, I mean, that, the wires are so crossed to buy into that, but they did. Uh, but back then, I think people really lost their sense of decency and their, and their moral compass. They just drifted off. They weren't even focused on that. Some cities even had public orgies out in the street and all other kind of public displays of sexuality openly in the street because they intentionally wanted to put their sexual immorality on display for everyone to see. Okay, now I don't know if any of this is starting to sound familiar to anybody, but I'll get to that, right? I mean, they didn't just excuse sexual immorality, they embraced it. They embraced a sexually immoral life. They thought it was awesome. And so sexual immorality became like an accepted part of their cultures. You see where I'm going? Became a, an accepted part of, of all their cultures, right? And that's what happens when you allow the world to define what's acceptable rather than God. When you allow the world to define your morals instead of God, this is what you end up with when people are left to their own devices, just this kind of mindset. Remember, the world is under the enemy's control until the Lord comes back. The Bible calls him the prince and the power of the air, the God of this present age. He is the one influencing the unbelieving forces in this world, right? And so all he wants is to, is to find people, find ways to, you know, to entice people into sinning against God. And he's not particular, but he knows this is an exceptionally powerful one. And this openly immoral mindset is why Paul said avoid sexual immorality. Imagine these people at every turn were being tempted. Men and women were being tempted at every turn with sexual immorality. And nobody would have thought anything about it. It was okay, except with God. But their cultures were okay with it. No one would have thought anything of it. And he's like, don't get sucked into that. I don't want you to get caught up in that. I don't want you to get distracted by that. But, you know, sadly, I mean, the world we live in today is a lot like the pagans of that time. Anybody notice that? There are things that are on TV that would have been rated R in 1981 in the movie theater. There are words, they say, in children's shows today that would have got a PG-13 rating in 1990. You know what I mean? I mean, it's unbelievable how just the mindset has changed about morality. It's unbelievable. This world is turning into just like these pagans of Paul's times, right? The world today seems to, I mean, also have completely embraced sexual immorality. I mean, embraced it. And they not only embrace this sexual immorality, they call it normal, right? I heard something the other day that really disturbed me. I'm kind of a geek about listening to, um, you know, I love listening to podcasts about teaching and stuff. And when I read, I like to read something that teaches me. My wife always goes, why don't you get this book? I said, I don't have time to read fantasy stuff. I, if I'm going to read something at my age with my terrible eyesight, it's going to teach me something. You know what I mean? But um, I, they were talking about how there were doctors now saying that they think it would be healthy to expose children to pornography starting at 12 months so that they would have a better idea of, how, of, of the choices in developing their sexual identity by starting them watching pornography. I, I, I just about fell over when I heard that. I couldn't believe that it was, they were trying to make it that normal. You know what I mean? And, and the devil loves that, and he's going to continue to promote that kind of thinking until the Lord comes back. That's his job. 
And if you notice, if anybody questions it, he's in a perfect situation because this country's bought in. I mean, it's bought into immorality. And, and he loves it because right now, if you question that sexual immorality of any kind, immediately they call you intolerant or, or judgmental or they call you a bigot. So it's almost like they're bullying you into seeing it their way. And if you don't, they attack you. It's just, it's unbelievable how we've gotten here. And what really bothers me, and I might make some people mad, and that's okay, suck it up, because a lot of churches and denominations and pastors are getting to the point where they're afraid to stand against sexual immorality. They're scared to stand against it because they're more worried about being politically correct and filling up that offering box than they are being biblically correct. I'm of the mindset that if I make you mad with the truth and you won't give, I'm not going to do without. God will make a way if he fills the box himself. I'm telling you. But it's unbelievable that we're there. We're at that point right now. Now, here's the reason. Everybody knows that sex is one of the most difficult temptations out there. And parents, you're not doing your kids any favors by not warning them about this stuff. Okay, because if you don't teach them, the TV and the school will teach them, and you will not like what they're teaching them, right? So I'm just saying that it's one of the most difficult temptations out there. And here's the truth. God designed people to desire sex. That's just the truth of the matter. But he did give us guidelines for that desire that we're supposed to follow, and we find it in Scripture. Sex was designed for marriage only as a means of procreation and bonding between two people. Right? And it's very important you understand that because some religions and churches some time ago, and I believe this doctrine still exists in some churches, but they used to teach that the only time you could be intimate with your spouse was if you were trying to procreate. Right? That's probably why they had 15 and 16 kids back then, would be my guess. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm just throwing it out there. Right? But thank God the scriptures prove that is not correct. <laughs> And let me read this to you. The scriptures actually encourage regular you know, sexual intimacy between a couple. Look at this, 1 Corinthians 7, 2. But because there is so much sexual immorality, and that is the Greek word again, pornea, uh, each man should have his own wife, and each woman should have her own husband. The husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs, and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. The wife gives authority. Now, I love how the NLT puts this, because it says the wife gives authority. It makes it see that this is a voluntary act. It says the wife gives authority over her body to her husband, and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so that you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. Afterwards, you should come together again. Now, here's the operative phrase of all that awkwardness, okay? So that Satan will not be able to tempt you because of your lack of what? Self-control. Self Okay, because of your lack of self-control. The enemy takes that natural sexual desire and uses it and perverts it to get you in a place where you can't be blessed by God. He redefines the natural godly boundaries that God set for sexual intimacy. And, you know, here's how it works. And this isn't in my outline, but I'm going to throw it out there for free. Here's how it works. With women, intimacy is more about, you know, uh, romance and, and emotion. With men, it's more physical. Now, that doesn't mean that with men it, there's no emotion or romance. It just means the driving factor with them is, is physical. I don't know why. And with women, it's more emotional. It doesn't mean it's not physical. It just means that the emotional and romantic is what drives them. And so you notice whenever there's an affair or when someone gets pulled out of their marriage, it's usually because the woman says, well, you know, he told me that he, wouldn't, he would spend more time with me if he were my husband. And he's such a good listener. He cares what I think. You know, anybody ever hear this story? That's the enemy knowing what drives them sexually and sending someone to tempt them. With men, it's more physical. I don't think I need to explain that. And people have asked me, why are they different? Well, because if they were both physical, nobody would go to work, I guess. I don't know. But <laughs> that's just the, way, just the way it is. So anyway, the enemy redefines that natu the natural godly boundaries because God knows that, that you know, if you are regularly intimate with, with your spouse, which is what it was designed for, that you're less likely to be tempted in either fashion, and that's the reason that he says that, okay? And that's really important, and I think sometimes we dodge this topic because we're so afraid to talk about it, but I'm telling you, this is not a topic you can afford to dodge because they are going to be taught it. It's even being taught in cartoons. You'd be shocked some of the plans they have for cartoons coming out in the next 10 years. It would blow your mind what they're going to be teaching these kids. So you better be teaching them at home and watching what they're watching. It's very, very important. But Paul knew he had to teach this. He knew that he had to remind them of this. Because he knew that, that when people get involved with sexual immorality or adultery, 
that it absolutely not only tears apart their individual lives, it tears their families' lives apart when they get involved in those things. And Paul wanted to make sure they understood that. And if you talk to people, they will tell you that's been through an adulterous situation. It doesn't just hurt a couple people. It kills the whole family. It hurts the entire family. Now let's move on. Verse 6. It says, never harm or cheat a fellow believer in this matter. If you're following along, underscore that. In this matter. By violating his wife, for the Lord avenges all such sins as we have solemnly warned you before. God has called us to live holy lives, not impure lives. Therefore, anyone who refuses to live by these rules is not disobeying human teaching, but is rejecting God who gives uh, his Holy Spirit to you. So I really like how he words that. Because in 6 through 8, he's very specific. He gives a specific example of immorality. And then he gives a warning. He said, never cheat a fellow believer in this matter. Now, what is in this matter referring to? It's referring back to that sexual immorality. That's what it's referring back to, specifically adultery. Paul said God called us to live holy lives, not impure lives. And that's really important because adultery and sexual immorality are the polar opposite of anything holy. And he's saying you can't do both. If you're involved in sexual immorality, you are not living a holy life. And, you know, if you are living a holy life, you shouldn't be that tempted to get involved in sexual immorality. So I love the way he words that. Uh, then he even gave him a real solemn warning. He said, the Lord avenges all such sin. He avenges all su such sin. And this is basically just classic reaping and sowing. He's reminding them, listen, yeah, you're saved. You are going to heaven. No one is going to change that. But know this. We always reap what we sow. Galatians 6, 7 tells us that. He said, we always reap what we sow. So if you get involved in this sexual immorality, there are going to be consequences that you do not want to have to put up with. But they will happen because you always reap what you sow. And as we said earlier, this just destroys lives. And that's one of those things uh, that comes as a consequence of sexual immorality. Now, in verse 8, Paul reminded them that rejecting this warning isn't about rejecting people. Right? He's saying, listen, I know people are going to reject you. That's what he's basically telling them. I know that there are those of you who are hearing this, and you've bought into what the culture teaches about sexual immorality, and you're going to blow me off. You're going to pretend that I'm old-fashioned and that you know, I'm just you know, an outdated, and you're going to blow me off. But he said, rejecting these teachings is not rejecting me. And when they reject your teaching, they're not rejecting you. They are rejecting God who authored those words. So keep teaching it. The rejection isn't personal. You're just a target. I mean, people get mad at me when I speak about God's view of all different forms of sexual immorality. They get so mad at me for one reason or another. This is when I get a lot of my emails. You know, I've had people stand up and walk out of church when I preached on some of these things before, just being honest. And that's okay. You know, I'm not going to chain anybody to the seat. But people get angry when the truth points out their shortcomings. They get angry about that. And when I teach it, they say I'm judgmental or, or I'm old-fashioned. Uh, but it's not really me they're attacking, and I know that. And I've had people say, well, aren't you mad? Aren't you going to debate with them? I'm like, no. It really has nothing to do with me. They're just shooting the messenger <laughs> is what they're doing. You know, they just don't like what I have to say. They're not actually attacking me. I'm just an easy target for all the guilt and shame they have. They're actually attacking God, right? And no matter how many people disagree with God or fight back against him, you know one thing I found? He's always right. Anybody ever debated with God? I know that sounds blasphemous, but I have. Has anybody else done that? You liars. <laughs> well, the reason I say that is if you ever, you know, you know something's wrong and you start justifying it to God like he didn't think of that angle, you're like, I know, Lord, the Bible says not to do this. God's going, oh, I got to hear this. Now what? But, you know, times have changed, and we start trying to, you know, and, but, you know, if I do this, maybe it'll bring somebody to Jesus. You, you never win those debates, ever. God is always right. And here's the problem. We've been raised to believe that the majority rules, haven't we? You know, go with the majority, the majority rules. But that's flawed thinking. I can cite thousands of examples where the majority caused a big problem. It did not rule. For instance, it was the majority that cried out, send us Barabbas and crucify Jesus. That was the majority, right? The majority is not always right. As a matter of fact, the Bible teaches us that the majority in this world are wrong because they are under the influence of the prince and the power of the air or Satan, right? Listen to this. And here's the big thing. Even if, let's say even if everybody 
agrees except you. If what they agree on is against the word of God, they're still wrong. Even if you're the only one that believes it. Look at Matthew 7, 13. I love what Jesus says here. He says, enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to what? Destruction. Destruction. Listen, the devil is not going to make it hard for you to do what's wrong. That would be stupid. Have you ever noticed that on TV they make the devil always show up like in this, you know, head spinning around, demon, you know, ghoul looking form that's all scary and stuff? That is not how he works. You're not going to convince a lot of people to follow you if you appear like, you know, Jason on Friday the 13th. It's just not going to happen, right? So he doesn't appear like that. He makes it easy. He makes it seem logical. He makes it seem like the opinion of the crowd is right. He makes it very easy. It said broad is... Uh, is broad that leads to destruction. It says, and there are many who will enter through it. And that statement has always bothered me, but it is true. There are more people who won't believe than will, and that's unfortunate. Verse 14, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. And when people read that, they say, so is God saying that he hides that? No. It's just that there's one way to heaven through Jesus. It's so simple. You believe that what he did was enough to guarantee your eternal life, and you have it. It's not about what you've done, because you can't be good enough. I know Christians love to be self-righteous and act like they deserve to be Christians. They don't. I don't. You don't. We get there because we have walked through the one door, Jesus. It's a simple path. You know, how many people would get lost if they said, here's how you get there. Get on State Road 6 and drive for 40 miles, and there's a huge building that says, stop here. People would know how to get there, right? Jesus said, here's how you do it. Believe in me. Narrow, but easy. Right, But there are few that find it because people are so used to majority rules. So listen, the majority may rule governments, but it certainly doesn't rule God. I'm going to move on because I could preach on that forever. Okay, so starting in verse 9, it says, but, but we don't need to write to you about the importance of loving each other. For God himself has taught you to love one another. Indeed, you already show your love for all believers throughout Macedonia. Even so, dear brothers and sisters, we urge you to love them even more. Now, the Thessalonians were known for their loving hearts and spirits. They were known for their dedication to God. They were known for showing love and compassion to people, even in other cities. Other cities were talking about the love that they displayed at such a young age as a church, right? And Paul said that their love for God and for people was something they learned from God himself, Meaning they, this wasn't something Paul taught them per se. It's something that they learned from God himself. And I, how that happens is it's not that God appeared to them in a vision. I, I'll tell you how that happened. It happened because they were regularly reading the word of God. That's how that happens. I guarantee it. That is how that happens. Here's something a lot of people don't know. The origin of true love is God. We wouldn't know true love if it wasn't for God. And apart from God, there is no such thing as true love. The people I say, well, what happens when I become a believer? With that dedication to God, will it pull me away from my family? No, it'll make you love your family like you never had before. It'll make you appreciate your family like you never had before. It'll make you love your children like you never had before. There is no such thing as love apart from God because the origin of true love is God. Look at 1 John 4, 7. He says, behold, let us love one another for love is from from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and what? Knows. knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Here it is. That's the definition. Love is God. God is love, right? Verse 9. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. I love what verse 9 does. It's, it's not only describing love, it tells us something about love. It tells us that love is an action. He said, here is God's love. He sent his only son, action, to die, another verb, action, for you. These are, these are action words because love is an action, right? Verse 10. In this, love, uh, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love what? One another. Huge. We should love one another. So if you really want to be pleasing to God, you have to be sure to read his word. Because that's how he speaks to you. It is impossible to be pleasing to God 
apart from his word. Look at 2 Timothy 2.15. It says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed. Accurately handling what? The word of truth. So how do you present yourself approved? How do you present yourself as a workman or someone who is serving regularly? How do you not be ashamed? By accurately handling the word of truth. And people always ask me what it means by ashamed. Has someone ever asked you a question and you don't know it? Now listen, that's going to happen no matter how much you know about the word of God. But if you don't read much at all, you can't answer much of anything. And it is embarrassing when they say, well, how do you know? And you're like, well, I, I don't know, I just know. Or my pastor says so, which drives me crazy, right? You have got to learn the word of God so that you can answer those people. And if you don't have the answer, listen, there's times people ask me questions. And it's funny, they'll come up to me like it's an easy question, you know? And they'll ask me a question like, so how do you relate the millennial kingdom with post-pre and mid and pre-wrath tribulation? And, and they go through this long thing, and I'm like, I cannot answer that before lunch, and I don't skip lunch. Let me get that answer for you, and I'll get it back to you. It's okay to say, I'll get it for you. You don't have to, you know, pretend you know. And it's nothing wrong in saying, I'm not 100% sure, let me check. But you've got to learn to accurately handle the word of truth. Now, there, were, there are several people who attempt to please God other ways. And it always drives me crazy, because I've had people literally tell me, yeah, I don't read much. But I work in the soup kitchen, and I, they start listing everything. I go, that's all great. It's good to do those things. But the Word of God should be the most important. It should be your biggest priority. Right? The Word of God is what's going to direct you. It's what's going to lead you. Now, I'm going to list some of the most popular ways people try to please God apart from the Word. See if these sound familiar. Religion. People try to please God with religion. You ever met somebody that's proud of their denomination? I'm a Baptist, right? I'm Catholic. I'm Pentecostal, whatever. And they act like that's, you know, what's getting them into heaven, like God's checking their papers and going, oh, Lutheran, no, sorry, you're not Baptist. You know what I mean, <laughs> that's not how it works, right? But religion is one of them, which is usually following what that, how I define it is, is following denominational rules and traditions. Not because the Bible says so, but because your religion says so. And I'm not going to name the religion, but I was talking to a woman who was very religious, and, and uh, there was another book that goes along with their faith. Try not to give this away. And she says, I said, well, why do you do that? She said, well, it says it in this other book. And I said, but that contradicts the Bible. Well, we understand that these books supersede the Bible. And I'm like, red light? Anybody else see a red light there? You know what I mean? So that's religion. Another way they try to please him apart from the word is legalism. I'll bet everybody in here knows a legalist, don't you? Everybody in here. Let me explain. Legalists are, legalists are people who try to prove their spirituality by following all kinds of man-made rules, right? And it's usually accompanied by them judging you for not being able to keep those rules or judging you because they keep them better than you. Or they're condescending. I'll never forget the lady one time told, right in front of me, and I had to just bite my tongue, which is not easy for me. But... This lady right in front of me was talking, and she said, well, I know that you don't get it yet. And when I was in my infancy stages in my faith, I was like you. But now that I've grown and learned to put my faith in, I'm sitting over here going, you know, trying not to hurl, because all she was listing was the works she had done, nothing about faith, right? So that's what a legalist looked like. They're big rule followers. And here's the last one I'll talk about. There's more, but time limits me. Separatism or separatists. And these are people who separate themselves from everybody who doesn't agree with them. And this is identified a lot of times in cults. I just want to know. I'm, I got two examples. I just want to see if you guys come up with the same. Give me, somebody give me one name of a cult that was a separatist, the leader of the cult. David Koresh. That's one of them. Somebody give him something. Right? <laughs> David Koresh is one of them. The other one, anybody think of this? Jim Jones, who said that? Good. Jim Jones. You guys ever watch that, that like documentary on that? I'm a documentary nerd. Yeah. I need to learn how that guy, you know, some of his methods. He convinced people to do crazy stuff. I can't convince people to do anything. You know what I mean? But those, those two cults that those leaders had were separatists. Part of the reason is they didn't want anybody else talking them out of the craziness they were putting in their head. So they're like, no, let's keep them in a compound so everyone doesn't prove to you that I am nuts. Right? And so let's get weapons so anybody that has common sense, we shoot before they get in here and infect us with truth, right? That's, that's what a separatist is. So anyway, I'm not going to go on about that forever. But 
All these attempts to please God, they're not only unnecessary, they're just a waste of time because they do not please him. It doesn't please God to try to find ways apart from the word to please him. It just doesn't work like that. There's only one way to be pleasing to God, and that is to daily live your faith. Look at this, Hebrews 11:6. It says, and without what? Faith. faith. I love this. It says, without faith, it's what? Impossible, Impossible to please him. It means if you are not pleasing him with your faith, you are not pleasing him. It's not your works. It's not your denomination. It is your faith, living your faith. I love this. It's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So a faith that inspires believers to read, pray, and worship, that's what's pleasing to God. And trust me, when you're trying your best to do those things, you will be pleasing to God. Now, Paul also acknowledged, uh, and he kind of praised him for all the great love they'd already shown for God and, and the great love they'd shown for the people, God's people and the people around them. And he also said, listen, don't let up. Don't let up. Don't ever let your passion start to die off. Don't let up. We want that love to continually grow. And I believe the reason he was pushing that was, remember, he really thought that Jesus was going to come back any minute. He really believed that. Paul, I, I personally think that Paul did not expect to die before Jesus came back. I mean, he thought it was that imminent. And so the reason he was pushing this so hard, obviously, first of all, because it's right, but second of all, he's like, you don't have time. You can't be getting involved in all this stupid stuff. You don't want Jesus to come back and find you involved in things that are not growing the kingdom. So stay focused on growing the kingdom. And you know what? I mean, just to be honest with you, I feel that it's still that imminent. He could be back any day. Now, I'm not, gonna, I'm not one of those nut jobs going to write a book that tells you how to decipher the code that tells you what day he's coming back. No one knows. It could be 10 minutes. It could be 1,000 years. I don't know. But I do know that there's nothing left to happen before his return and in, in, in end times uh, prophecy. Nothing. The next thing in line in end times prophecy is the return of Christ and taking his church. That's the next thing to happen. And I tell my wife all the time, I can't imagine this world in 10 years. Now, I'm sure Paul said that then. But I, can you? I'm about to have a grandbaby. I'm so excited about that. But I'm scared to death. When she's 10 or 11, what are they going to face? Look what's going on now. What are they going to face? What kind of crazy stuff is going to be going on then? Right? So I still believe he could return at any minute. So I want to encourage you the same way Paul did. Paul was saying, just stay focused. Serve God. Share the gospel. Love people. So that when the Lord comes back, which could be tomorrow, he'll find you doing something faithful and will be able to reward you. I just love how he was pushing that. Paul wanted him to be focused. And, and I love this in verse 11 and 12. He gave him a couple more things that were really important, starting in verse 11. He said, make it your goal to live a quiet life. Underscore that, if you're following along. Minding your own business. Let me back up. Make it your goal to live a quiet life. What kind of life? Quiet. quiet. We're going to come back to that. Minding what? Your own. your own business. Mind your own business and working with your hands. Underscore that like six times, just as we instructed you before. Then people who are not believers will respect the way you live, and you will not need to depend on others. Okay. The, I might go over with this topic. Okay, so first, he wanted them to lead quiet lives. Now, in the Greek, that means peaceful. It didn't mean they were supposed to walk around like monks with their mouth covered. It meant peaceful. Basically, he didn't want believers to be looking for someone to argue and fight with. He didn't want you trying to find ways to fight with people. He doesn't want that. Instead, he wants us to be peaceful and at peace with people as much as we can be. Now, if they're attacking our faith, then we got to fight back. But he wants us to be at peace as much as possible. And let's be honest, nobody will listen to those angry, argumentative Christians. Nobody wants to listen to them. They just make fun of them. That's exactly what happens. Listen, that's why I'm constantly warning people about getting in social media squabbles. You know what? Someone who you might have been able to influence, they see your bitter words and your angry comments to other people, and they're like, yeah, I'm not talking to that guy about Jesus. I tick him off. He might blow me up on social media. You know, that's honest to goodness truth. He wants us to live 
peaceful lives. Now, the second thing Paul said was they needed to be sure to mind their own business. That means nobody likes nosy busybodies. Nobody likes that, right? And I don't know if you've noticed this, but no one wants someone butting into their life uninvited. And that's what happens on social media every day. And people get mad about it. I'm like, if you don't want people butting into your life, don't post stuff about your life that you're all sensitive about. Because when you put it out there, you're saying, what do you think? That's what you're doing, right? So he's saying, listen, mind your own business. When you see those people squabbling on Facebook, don't get in it. Don't get in it. You don't have time to be fighting other people. You need to be showing the love of Christ. Get away from that stuff, right? Focus on that. Don't, and that's what you're being. You're being a busybody. You're being nosy, and you're picking fights and violating the peace that God's asked us to have. All right, now third, Paul told us to work with our own hands. That's what he was telling them. Earn your own living. Okay, so in other words, God doesn't want able-bodied people leeching off the hard work of other people. That's exactly, now you might get mad, but this is the truth, and if it hurts, I must be, I must be talking to you. Okay, he does not want able-bodied people leeching off other people who are out there working hard. So in other words, God doesn't like laziness. So if you can work, do so. That's what he's saying here. If you can work, do so. Listen to this, 2 Thessalonians 3.9. He said, for even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. That should be motivation. Verse 11, for we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Listen, if you're not busy working, you'll be busy doing something. Trust me, right? You ever hear that uh, uh, an idle mind is the devil's playground? It's the truth. Uh, verse 12, now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. And he's saying, earn your own bread living. Earn your own living, right? Now, Paul reminded them that believers who live like that, people who were quiet or peaceful, people who are minding their own business, people who work hard every day, people will respect you when you live lives like that. I mean, don't you respect people like that who stay out of people's business and, and, and they show the love of God and they're hardworking? Don't you respect those people? Well, when they respect you, they'll listen to you. But if you're the opposite of that, they're not going to listen to you because they're going to be like, listen, if, if serving God means butting into everybody's business, fighting on Facebook, if it means staying home and not working when you're totally able to work and leeching off me, if that's what being a godly person is, you can have it. You don't ever want to be the person that makes someone think that way. And this is what Paul was telling them. Don't live that kind of life because that's what you make people think. Be peaceful. Mind your own business. Work hard. People will hear you. Right, And they will want to know what's going on in your life. They'll want you to explain the reason for the hope that lies within you. So that's, that's basically what living life expectantly looks like. Those three things, Paul was just saying, mind your business, stay focused, love people, work hard. And when God comes back, when Jesus comes back, if he finds you doing those things, you'll be rewarded for doing what you should do. But all those things that he warned you about, if you get pulled off the path for those things, guess what? You won't be rewarded. He's not going to be pleased with you. He's just trying to put them in a state where they can be rewarded because he truly believed any day Jesus would come back, and that's what he was preparing them for. Uh, now, I'm going to stop there because next week, the next few verses are very, very end times oriented. Okay, again, that's called eschatology, the study of end times. And there is a lot, lot, lot in the next few verses. I don't even know if I can preach next week in one sermon. I'm going to try, but not if it misses stuff. But I, don't miss because they're, we're going to answer a lot of questions, we're going to settle a lot of arguments, but I really want you to be aware of God's plan for the end, and we'll, we'll cover that in, in great detail next week. So let's go ahead and close there. I'm going to ask you, would please bow your heads. If this is your first time, we always like to give a brief invitation, and all that is, if, if, if you're not sure where you stand, and you'd like me to pray for you, or maybe you just need prayer. I don't want to chase you down. Bless those people. Uh, just make eye contact me, put your head down. Bless those people, and I'm going to pray for you. Bless those people. Bless those people. I'm not chasing you down. Bless those people. I just, you know what? Prayer is your greatest asset that God's given you. Use it and let me use it with you. Bless those people. If you're listening online or watching online, God knows your heart. I'll be praying for you. 
But believers, I always pray for us. And people always say, why do you bring that up every week? We know that you're gonna be praying for us. Well, when you start living lives I don't have to pray for, I'll quit. But me included, we always need prayer. We could always do better. Especially in the days we live in now, we need people to hold the line. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for everything you do. We thank you for your son, Jesus. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you were willing to come and die innocently on that cross so that those of us who are guilty, who deserve that death, could have eternal life free of charge. We thank you, God, that it's not about how good we are or how good we can be. It's not about our reputation. It's about faith. The only work that matters is the work that you did. We know that we're incapable of righteousness apart from you, and we thank you that you gave us a means of attaining that righteousness through faith. If there's someone here who doesn't know you, whatever's holding them back, whether it be religion or whatever, just wash it out of their mind. We know, Lord, that this, this was never supposed to be complicated. You took care of the complicated part so that we could believe. Please let them make that decision. If they do, we pray they contact us so we can support them. But God, for those of us who are believers, there are so many things that pull us aside. There are so many conversations happening, Lord, and you know in Christian circles that have nothing to do with you. Let us get our hearts and minds focused. Let us live expectantly. God, we know that any day you can come back. When you do, let us be found serving you. Let us be found loving others the way you loved us. Because in the end, we're here to enlarge the borders of the kingdom by allowing you to use us. Just please let us embrace that. We just pray that you would keep us safe as we, live, as we leave here and let us live what we profess. And if you don't return to take us home before we meet again, Lord, let us come together one more time and give you all the praise, honor, and glory you're so worthy of. We just thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' name.